Welcome, everyone. Um, we're a few minutes late, but we're going to make up for it in quality. Um, so it's, my name is Martin Williams. I'm an associate professor here at the Blavatnik School. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight Paolo Dorenzio. Um, Paolo is a senior research fellow at the International Budget Partnership and an adjunct lecturer at PUC Rio in Brazil. Um, Prior to his current position, um, Paolo actually did a DPhil here under the supervision of, of one Nairi Woods, who some of you might have heard of, um, when back before Blavatnik was a, was a school that existed. Um, and then prior to that, Paolo had also worked in various roles, including uh, in the Papua New Guinea Ministry of Finance as an, over, as an Overseas Development Institute fellow. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Paolo now. He's going to speak for sort of 35 or 40 minutes. Um, and then we're going to open it up for questions at the end. So Paolo, Great. over to you. Thanks, Martin. And uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, Actually, I remember, so Martin said I, was, I, I used to be a student here. And I remember in the last, uh, I sort of finished my DPhil in 2011. And the last two years that I was here, Nairi was busy creating this uh, creature that I now see in its full-blown <laughs> magnificence. At, at that time, she was basically running around the school trying to, uh, um, you know, ima imagine what uh, the Blavatnik school might look like. And we had all of these discussions about, you know, should it be a two years program, a one year program? What should the curriculum look like? And uh, she was, you know, showing us uh, proposals for the, for the building that were coming in at the time. So it was it's pretty amazing. It's my first time back after the, the new building has been, uh, has been open. So uh, it's, it's, it's really quite impressive. And it's the first time that I get to meet some of the, some of the students on the, on the program here. Uh, yeah, as Martin said, basically after, I mean, I have a, let's say, a, like a long history of working with uh, public policy and public finance more, more generally. Uh, in, in my latest incarnation, working on it from a civil society perspective. So how many of you have heard of the International Budget Partnership? One, two, only two. That's good. So from today onwards, you can also say that you've heard about it. So IBP is a, is a network of uh, civil society organizations. We, it's a pretty sort of small international NGO that does a couple of things. It sort of uh, uh, does research and campaigning and supports the civil society work across, uh, across the world uh, that uh, monitors and advocates for improved budget policies. So there's... Uh, a big share of our work is done at the international level, and we produce every two years something called the Open Budget Index, which is basically a ranking of countries on uh, how much information they, they make publicly available about revenues, expenditure, debt, uh, service delivery, and other, other similar uh, aspects of, of public finance and of government budgeting. And then we actually support country-level work uh, with civil society groups that do a similar thing at the country level. So they, they access government information, they analyze budget data, they um, sort of set up campaigns to influence government policy around public spending and revenues and so on. And it may well be that in some of the countries that you're from, we actually have uh, some active partners. You may know some of them and so on. It's a shame uh, we had tried to get one of your colleagues, Pepe, uh, to also participate in this, uh, in this seminar today. Pepe is Brazilian. I'm Italian originally, but I live in Brazil nowadays. And uh, we have a, a few very interesting partners that, that do some very interesting work in Brazil. And I'll show you a short video that includes some of, uh, some of that work uh, uh, sort of halfway through my, my presentation. But basically, the theme of my, of my talk here today is based on uh, a paper that I recently published with... Um, with a good friend and colleague who teaches at the, at the London School of Economics, Joachim Wehner, who actually happens to be uh, Martin's former uh, PhD supervisor. Uh, and um, where we basically surveyed all of the evidence that exists out there about the impacts of a special kind of transparency, which is basically fiscal transparency, you may call it, or budget transparency. So transparency around public finances. All of the information that governments uh, make available to citizens about uh, fiscal policy and what are the impacts that that information has on a series of, uh, uh, of other variables. And why do we want to, did we want to uh, survey this evidence? It's basically because transparency has become uh, 
a little bit of a buzzword in policy circles and international development circles. And uh, some of what I will, uh, so, you know, part of the argument that I will try to make today is that often buzzwords and evidence don't necessarily go well together. And there's a series of problems that happen when buzzwords sort of enter the scene of a specific policy area uh, that basically gets evidence you know, thrown out of the window because the buzzword means uh, um, that uh, you know, people tend to think that it, it, it will have an impact no matter what, even if the evidence says otherwise. So let me just quickly tell you a little bit about how the uh, uh, presentation will work. So I'll start from this issue that, you know, transparency has become a bit of a development buzzword uh, in modern times, so in the last, let's say, 20 years or so. But also talk, say a few things about the fact that it has quite a long history. It's not something that is new at all. And I'll say a few things about that. Then I'll talk about the fact that, as I, as I said, that uh, there's, there's often a bit of a disconnect between uh, what people uh, believe when a buzzword is involved and what the evidence says about uh, that specific buzzword. And the fact that this, this disconnect is often based on a number of what I call here cognitive fallacies, and I'll say a few things about that. I'll then go into the work that we did on reviewing the evidence um, about whether, and specifically we'll talk about fiscal openness, so the paper that I published with Joachim is the impacts of fiscal openness. So it's about a very specific type of disclosure and a very specific type of uh, 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 other related mechanisms for engaging citizens in fiscal decision making. And the spoiler is that, yes, it works, <laughs> but there's a, there's a, as usual, and there's a comma, but, dot, dot, dot. There's a few provisos and a few uh, additional comments that, uh, that I will make regarding that overall result. And then I'll say a few things about, about what ne what's next in terms of improving the evidence base and improving the theoretical constructs that we utilized to make sense of that relationship between the buzzword and, uh, and the evidence. And as I mentioned, much of this presentation is actually based on this recent paper that we published in the World Bank uh, Research Observer, but it draws on some other work that I'll mention along the way. So how do you know a buzzword when you hear one? Uh, Tom Carruthers at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace has been a, a sort of a keen observer of this uh, policy field in recent years, mostly related to debates around governance and development, democracy and development, and uh, a few years ago, he published a paper with a colleague of his saying, basically, if you want to get a job in an international development agency, all you have to do is knock on the door and say, transparency, participation, accountability, inclusion, the doors will open, open sesame, and you'll be offered, you know, there's going to be red carpets uh, rolled out, and you'll be offered a job because basically everybody will sing, yes, you know, this person is right, these are the right words, these are the things that we're trying to promote, these are the things that make a difference in our uh, mission to eradicate poverty and, uh, and, and promote sustainable development. Usually when that happens, you're pretty sure that uh, you're faced with a, with a buzzword. And it's definitely true um, that the last, let's say, you know, 10, 15, maybe up to 20 years have seen a flurry of new initiatives uh, that have been set up at the international level, many of these you'll certainly have, uh, have heard of that include the word the transparency or the word openness in one way or another. So the Open, open Government Partnership has been very much uh, hailed as, a, uh, as an important multi-stakeholder uh, initiative that promotes openness in government. Uh, it has now more than, you know, uh, I, I don't know the last count, but it was sort of more than 60 governments have signed up to the Open Government Partnership and they speak to their civil society and they, they sort of uh, devise national action plans that include different initiatives and activities that are then monitored independently and followed up uh, through, uh, through regular reporting. The Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is, uh, is about the extractive sector and promoting transparency in uh, mining, oil, and other uh, similar industries. The International Aid Transparency Initiative is about similar things dealing with foreign aid. Open contracting is about uh, promoting transparency in government procurement. Uh, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency that I will uh, talk a little bit more of because it, it sort of deals more squarely with the, with the issue that uh, 
we work on at the International Budget Partnership. We actually help set up the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency as a, again, a multi-stakeholder initiative that promotes fiscal openness in its widest sense. And then there's, other, there's, there's many others that I don't mention here. The Transparency and Accountability Initiative is a multi-donor uh, initiative for, that funds a number of research and, uh, and other initiatives around the promotion of, of transparency and accountability. So definitely, this is another sign that a, that a buzzword is, uh, is at work when you see so many different initiatives at a certain, uh, within a limited time frame, uh, adopting that language and promoting that language in a number of different, uh, different sectors. If we zoom in on the issue of fiscal transparency and fiscal openness more generally, another sign of a buzzword at work is the fact that at the international level you see more norms and standards being produced and more evidence being produced because everybody's sort of interested and wants to be seen to, uh, uh, to be part of that movement. Uh, just as a few, just to sort of highlight a few um, milestones over the past couple of decades, the IMF probably was sort of the, 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 the first to, to sort of see the train out of the station after the 97 Asian financial crisis, they um, designed a, a code of a good practices for fiscal transparency with a related manual, uh, which they then updated twice in the, in the, in the following years. And they carried out a series of uh, assessments. The old ones were called fiscal ROSCs. For those of you who are more in the field, reports on the observance of standards and codes in a more recent and revised incarnation they're called fiscal transparency valuations. But basically, the IMF has been an active proponent of the idea that fiscal transparency is important and it should be promoted because it leads to a series of expected positive outcomes, which is something that we will uh, further discuss. The OECD followed suit in 2002, uh, publishing something called the best practices on budget transparency, which basically set out without, um, so the IMF does all of this kind of you know, surveillance work and policy work at country level, so they have a lot of power pushing governments to do things. The OECD is different, it's a different kind of animal, it's sort of the rich country club. They don't tell each other what to do, they sort of promote this uh, soft approach to uh, you know, peer pressure and norms development based on consensus. But basically, they sort of gathered everybody. They said, yes, budget transparency is important, and every government should be publishing these different types of documents and information uh, across the different stages of the, of the budget cycle. The IBP, the organization that I worked for, then sort of used some of these uh, evolving norms and standards to develop uh, the first open budget survey, which, which happened in 2006. As I said, we've been sort of you know, publishing this, uh, the survey and the related index uh, pretty much every two years since. We had a three-year break at some point because we revised the methodology, but uh, we're basically bringing the sixth uh, round to a close, and the results will be published in January of, uh, of 2018. Uh, so now we kind of, you know, with the IMF and the IBP, we now have a, a pretty uh, extensive a set of data and information based on international norms and standards to measure what transparency in fiscal policy and in budget, in government budgeting, might actually look like, both across countries and, and over time, which of course then facilitates some of the analyses and the studies that I will talk about. Um, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, which I mentioned already, at the beginning as a multi-stakeholder initiative, which includes governments, uh, international organizations, civil society groups, uh, and some other professional associations and so on. The first thing that it did was also to come up with something called the high-level principles for fiscal transparency and participation, which were then endorsed uh, following a proposal by the Brazilian government by the United Nations General Assembly. So again, the, the, the normative framework around the buzzword keeps expanding and, and reaching, reaching further and being gradually incorporated into people's mindsets and in government practices around the world. And even more recently, the OECD revised, at least slightly, uh, uh, the content of its previously called the best practices. It promoted a set of principles on good budgetary governance, which are you know, more broad 
definitely uh, broader than just the budget transparency, but they include a specific principle, uh, principle four that says all governments should ensure that budget documents and data are open, transparent, and accessible. So here you also see the fact that in the meantime, uh, the, the, let's say that the, the buzzword wave of transparency has gained new force with technological developments. So nowadays, a lot of the talk around fiscal transparency is about open data, fiscal transparency portals, and all of the things that governments are now able to do because of the uh, uh, information technology that has become available uh, over the past decade or two. Yet, as I said, and this is just sort of a slight, uh, you know, a, a one slide historical uh, detour, often we, we, you know, we think of buzzwords as something new that has come onto the scene and that all of a sudden has you know, taken the world by, by storm. In fact, fiscal transparency, transparency more generally, have a very long and distinguished history. You can go all the way back to uh, Aristotle's politics, 350 years before the birth of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, it says that in order to protect the treasury from being defrauded, all money should be issued openly in front of the whole city, and copies of the accounts should be deposited in various wards. That means, you know, back in sort of uh, the cradle of modern democracy, fiscal transparency was already a principle that was being at least promoted and, and, and talked about. Uh, fast forward, uh, you know, a couple of millennia to uh, the days of the French Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Uh, there's an article in there that says society has the right to require of every public agent an account of his administration. Again, uh, stating the fact that citizens have a right to access public information about how public resources are used, stating the principle that fiscal transparency is important. And uh, more recently, about a, about a century ago, uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis, Louis Brandeis uh, made the, you know, his famous quote about sunlight being the best of disinfectants, about the fact that transparency is a, a, a good practice in government uh, to ensure that uh, corruption, malpractice, malfeasance, uh, any other kinds of, of inefficiencies and so on can be uh, resolved or at least partly tackled. And this is, again, just a general point about the fact that despite us now seeing this sort of, uh, you know, a lot of talk about transparency in, in international development circles and in policy circles more generally, the idea is an idea with a long and, uh, uh, and very well respected, uh, very well respected history. Okay, let's now come to this issue of buzzwords and evidence and the fact that uh, very often uh, when buzzwords are involved, people often fall into a series of cognitive fallacies that sort of create a disconnect between the buzzword and the evidence related to the buzzword. So I've, uh, I call the first one normative bias. Okay, we know that there's a principle out there that transparency is a good thing. Transparency is a right. And then of course, you know, if it is a right, then it must work. You know, if, if people have been saying that it is important, that it's a good idea and that uh, everybody has a right to, to access information and to be informed about fiscal policy, then it means that it must make a difference. So then, of course, uh, uh, we don't need to look at the evidence because we know that by principle uh, it must work. Second cognitive fallacy is the fallacy of wishful thinking. When, according to you know, my own ideas and my own approach, you know, my own saying, whatever, any person who works at the World Bank or at the, any other of these international development agencies that have adopted the new development consensus that Tom Carruthers was, was talking about, if I say I would like it to work, then I'm definitely going to uh, think that it must work, meaning I will select evidence uh, on purpose so that it fits my worldview, it fits my belief about, uh, uh, about how it should work. The third one, which I've, I've seen a number of, of times in my professional life, is truth by repetition. If people keep saying that it works, then it must mean that it works, right? And the, the, the fourth one and, and final one is false generalization. And this again, so we see this happening all the time in a number of different policy circles. There's evidence that it worked somewhere at some point in time, 
And all of a sudden, there's a general belief that it works everywhere else, no matter the context, no matter the point in time. So if it works somewhere, therefore it must work everywhere. And these cognitive fallacies, they lead to something that we could call policy-based evidence making, which is basically you start with the idea or with the buzzword, and then you just go out and seek the evidence that supports that, that idea or that buzzword. And certainly we've, uh, we've seen a lot of that happening uh, around, uh, around transparency more generally and around fiscal transparency and fiscal openness more, more specifically. Let me show you three quick um, statements. The first one is from the IMF, and it's a little bit more cautious, a little bit more serious, you know, typical IMF style. Fiscal transparency is critical for effective fiscal management and accountability. So it's, it's, it's critical for, it means it's, you know, it's not the only determinant, but it's an important factor and it sort of plays into uh, the generation of positive outcomes like uh, good fiscal management and government accountability. Move across the street to the World Bank and the statement already becomes a little bit more ambitious and a little bit more uh, straight in terms of uh, saying, you know, budget transparency leads to less corruption, more efficient use of resources, more trust in government and higher revenues. So there's a range of different desirable outcomes which budget transparency leads to. Again, it's not, you know, it's, it's sort of almost like a direct contribution. Then you move uh, a few blocks away to the <laughs> home of the NGO that I work for and we go to these, you know, outrageous uh, uh, statements where basically if you open budgets, you transform lives. That's our tagline. Which of course, you know, it's, it's, it's NGO talk, you know, as NGOs we're allowed to do that. There's a, there's a lemma that if you want to sort of uh, uh, pass on a message in NGO speak, what you do is simplify and exaggerate. So that's, that's what we did to sort of make the case uh, in favor of budget transparency. And I'll show you a little video here that uh, uh, tells you just a little bit more about the work that we do and some of the partners that we work with. The biggest strategic threat we face in the world today is global poverty and inequality. The budget is the government's primary economic tool to improve the lives of its poorest citizens. The International Budget Partnership works with partners in over 100 countries to make sure that the public resources that governments have available are directed to those that need them the most. Together, we have enough money to end extreme poverty globally. I'm Yara Pietrikowski. I'm a human rights activist. My organization, INESC, works to monitor the national budget. I'm Paul Divaka. I'm a Dalit human rights activist, and it's an appalling condition that Dalits face. My name is Zaki Ahmed. I'm a social justice activist. In 1998, I co-founded the Treatment Action Campaign because I live with HIV and because almost one in eight people in South Africa live with HIV. Most Dalits in India are still treated as untouchables. We get the worst horrifying jobs. The poverty rate is highest among Dalits and literacy rates are very low. When we assert our rights as per the constitution, there is a severe backlash in the way the government allocates resources. Institutional discrimination that exists, uh, even through the budgets. We thought budgets were very neutral. A few years ago, we discovered that the Brazilian government was trying to present a new bill on taxation system that would slash the money for social programs. A lack of money for education, public education, health, and many other programs that are very important for the poor of the country. In 2010, while government was preparing for the Commonwealth Games, we have come across huge amounts of money uh, to the extent of $150 million. The government felt compelled to take the resources away which should have gone to social services and uh, other uh, utilities for the development of the Dalits to building huge stadiums. The ANC was in government. I had joined it when I was in prison in 1980. Yet now the ANC government refused access to antiretroviral treatment because our president, Thabo Mbeki, did not believe that HIV caused AIDS. Years of struggle, of civil disobedience, of going to the courts. We came to understand the importance of economics and the budget. Governments raise and spend public money. That's our money. 
to provide health services, welfare services and education that's required by all citizens, but especially by those that are poor and marginalised. In all the countries that IBP works, we have witnessed how in citizens, civil society organisations and the media get involved in budget discussions. There's a greater likelihood that the decisions that the government reaches are fair and there's a greater chance that the resources that the government spends actually reach those people that it's meant to reach. What we have done was organize and articulate with many other groups of the Brazilian society in order to press for a new way, a new thought in terms of taxation system. Taxation is a very difficult issue. Siguen no claros, no equidad, igualdad. Estamos hablando la misma cosa. Eh, lo que significa desarrollo sostenible. People don't know how to make the linkage with uh, their lives, their difficulties, and the way government are using or misusing the money, the public money. In the end, the courts ruled that government had to provide mothers with antiretroviral treatment. This meant thousands and thousands of babies' lives were saved. It also meant that we had to struggle to access antiretrovirals not only for mothers and women, but for every person in South Africa. Today, two and a half million people are on antiretroviral. I believe that every activist should understand a budget, the economics of society, and ensure that communities understand it. When we equipped ourselves with the tools of analyzing budgets, of looking at how the fund flows take place, we found that this money should have gone to the Dalits and then we released it to the press to the extent that the government felt pressurized to declare that what it has done is really indeed uh, not right and returned the money. And over the, over the next year it has returned 80% of the money that it has uh, diverted. Once the policy and the budgets are analyzed and put together, then you have a tremendous amount of empowerment. And in our experience, this has really changed the lives of Dalits and it has empowered them to claim their rightful resources. Together, these three elements, information, skills and opportunity, can unlock our potential to transform the world. At the International Budget Partnership, we work with citizens, civil society organizations and the media around the world to make sure that we hold governments accountable for the ways in which they spend public money. We know that stories from Tanzania, from South Africa, from India, Indonesia need not be the inspiring exception. They can be the norm. With open budgets together, we can transform lives. Sounds good, right? I mean, these are very inspiring stories of people and groups in different countries uh, who use the information that governments were publishing to you know, hold them accountable for policy choices that they were making, which would have created big problems and disadvantages, usually for poorer and more marginalized groups of the population, HIV positive people, uh, the untouchable caste, uh, uh, you know, spending for social services and so on and so forth. So clearly there's some interesting stories in there about the power of transparency when coupled with, uh, uh, as, as my boss was saying in that, in that final bit, skills and opportunities. So the capacity of civil society groups to analyze information, but also opportunities for them to engage with governments so that they can influence, uh, influence policy making. Yet, at the same time, you also see some of those cog cognitive fallacies in place, right? So you say, okay, uh, those three specific uh, initiatives were successful in India, Brazil, and South Africa in very specific contexts at very specific points in time. Can we say anything about whether the same thing could happen in you know, uh, Uganda, Mexico, or uh, Vietnam uh, trying to replicate what happened in, in those three countries? I don't, probably not. Or if so, we would have to really think about what it means to 
transfer some of the mechanisms that were utilized in one country to another, to another one. Uh, so there's an issue of, uh, you know, false generalization. There's an issue, a certain degree of wishful thinking as well. Uh, so clearly cognitive fallacies kind of tend to cloud the judgment of actors involved in the field, playing to their own belief systems, playing to their own worldview. Uh, and the work that we did trying to review the evidence that exists out there about the linkages between fiscal transparency and, and, and participation in budget policies and different sets of desirable outcomes was in fact uh, attempting to shed some light onto these, uh, 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 onto these questions. So let me, before I dive into the, re the results that we found from our more comprehensive survey, let me say a couple of things about findings from a book that we published in 2013 uh, together with a couple of external researchers, uh, uh, Arkun Fung from the Kennedy School and uh, Sanjeev Kagram from uh, Occidental College, who helped us over a number of years review a set of uh, quantitative studies coupled with nine country case studies that we, uh, that we carried out looking at both the causes and the consequences of fiscal transparency. So we started basically from this you know, general conceptual model that if you have transparency and if you give citizens opportunities to engage, to participate, that's the P out there, the sum of these two will lead to accountability. So governments will be uh, held accountable for how they use public resources and therefore they will uh, change their policy. In fact, when we looked across uh, 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 all of the information that we could find from these quantitative studies and from the country case studies, we actually saw that it didn't quite work like that. So while we saw a number of instances of you know, more information being put in the public domain, actually this didn't at all you know, translate one-to-one -one into citizens and civil society organizations taking that information, analyzing it, and using it to take advantage of participation opportunities. And even less so, the sum of those two actually led to government accountability. So it was... Uh, the, the, um, let's say that equation was not really an equation, it was a funnel. Uh, uh, you know, moving from transparency to participation and accountability, we were moving uh, to a decreasing number of countries and to an increasingly uh, stringent set of conditions. In order for transparency to result in accountability, you need to have uh, a, a free press, you need to have uh, civil society groups that have a certain level of capacity, uh, a, a certain capacity to mobilize and create coalitions. You need to have, in order to move towards accountability, you need to have other institutions that may help citizens put pressure, like parliaments or audit institutions. You need to have responsive governments, uh, which you know, often uh, is something that depends on, on some deeper political uh, realities and some deeper political dynamics in the different contexts. So it, this is not at all something that we should... Uh, uh, take for granted and something that we need to actually uh, study in more detail. So then we said, okay, uh, what can we make of all of the, we're not the only ones thinking about this, so we shouldn't just look at our work or the work of our partners, we should go out there and basically take stock of all of the evidence that exists out there. So uh, Joachim Wiener and I basically did you know, a very broad a search of all of the literature that exists out there. Uh, and in the end, we ended up uh, focusing on a set of 38 studies, which range in time from the early 90s until just a couple of years back, which is when sort of we completed this, uh, this project. We focused on material and research products that were either published in peer-reviewed journals or other credible sources, book chapters from academic presses, uh, working papers from you know, more reputable organizations like the IMF and the World Bank, uh, to some extent IBP as well, but, uh, and basically um, looking at all of these 38 studies uh, that satisfied two key criteria. The first one was studies that empirically evaluated a causal claim about the impact of an element of fiscal openness, be it either disclosure of information or the provision of opportunities for citizen engagement in fiscal processes and, uh, and budget policies, and that at the same time were basically of sufficient substance uh, in terms of you know, being original piece of research that was based on new evidence that was collected with that question in mind. 
We focused more specifically on interventions that were due to government action, so governments proactively putting information in the public domain, governments proactively creating opportunities for citizen engagement and participation. And we uh, sort of covered a, a, a range of different studies, as I said, both transparency and participation, either transparency and participation or both in a very few cases, uh, both cross-country and single-country uh, studies, both national and subnational level. So this was basically our body of evidence that we, that we reviewed. And in order to try and make sense of it, we developed um, a conceptual model or some kind of a theory of change, you might call it, where basically you have fiscal openness interventions as sort of the key entry point, basically our uh, independent variable of interest. Uh, these interventions were either of the transparency kind or, the, or of the participation kind. They could happen at different stages of the budget cycle from drafting to approval to execution to audit. Uh, we would expect that these would influence as a first a sort of intermediate stage uh, the quality of the budget and some, of, some key budget outcomes like fiscal discipline, for example, aggregate fiscal balances, allocation of resources to different sectors and different ministries, and uh, uh, the delivery of services uh, sort of downstream into the uh, specific sectors and specific uh, localities. But those, of course, were sort of intermediate outcomes. And the ones that we were, or the people, let's say, are mostly interested in are either you know, directly development outcomes in terms of indicators of people's well-being of different types, but also governance outcomes uh, in their broader sense. And sometimes there is a direct link, and sometimes there can be, as you can see, sort of the direction of the arrows, uh, development outcomes being um, brought about by improvements in, in governments. And when I in governance. And when I say governance, there's, there's a series of issues there. There's issues of accountability, there's issues of corruption, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So we started out with this model in mind and with those 38 studies. And this is what we found. So we had basically uh, a first set of uh, papers that looked at the linkages between fiscal transparency and what we call macrofiscal outcomes as, as a general category of a dependent variable. And we found that, at least on average, across a number of different uh, uh, studies that were carried out, higher levels of fiscal transparency are linked to lower deficits and to lower debt, which basically are signals of, of better fiscal management and aggregate fiscal discipline. More transparent countries also face lower borrowing costs. Uh, on international financial markets uh, through better, better sovereign credit ratings. So countries, that, governments that were more transparent got better ratings, and as a consequence of that, their, their spreads were lower, and so they were able to borrow at cheaper, at cheaper prices. Transparency also helped contain so-called creative accounting or fiscal gimmicks, meaning uh, governments could not really, you know, if the information was out there, it was more difficult for them to cheat and to... Uh, 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 basically provide figures that were not corresponding to, uh, to the truth. This was very clear, for example, in some research that was done um, uh, pre and post uh, the EU rules on, on fiscal discipline, where you see uh, countries that are less transparent being much, much better able to hide the true extent of the deficit and debt in order to qualify for, uh, basically to satisfy uh, European Union criteria for fiscal management. And then the final one that, that came up uh, was that transparency helps reduce the effects of the political budget cycle. Political budget cycle is that you know, typical thing that you see where basically governments in the year previous, uh, in the year before the election, they basically overspend, run up huge deficits, try to spend a lot more so that they can get reelected. Then the election comes, and then of course they have to adopt much more stringent policies and. Uh, uh, and have a surplus in order to pay off the debt, and so on and so forth. And what uh, Alton Lassen, in, in a study that they did uh, across a number of OECD countries uh, over time, they looked, they found that countries that have lower transparency levels suffer from a much bigger uh, political cycle effect than countries that have higher fiscal transparency. So if there's more information out there, it will be more difficult for governments to run up big deficits in the year before the election and then uh, having to pay them off uh, afterwards. <clears throat>
So there's a basically a, a reasonably consistent set of findings on the linkages between uh, fiscal transparency and macrofiscal outcomes. Second category of outcomes, resource allocation and service delivery. So we're moving, let's say, to the, the other parts of those intermediate outcomes that we identified as, as being part of the quality of the budget. The findings here, interestingly, are actually much less linked to transparency per se, but they're a lot more about participation. They're a lot more about opportunities existing uh, uh, for citizens to engage with budget making and, and policy making uh, to different extents. So for example, the introduction of participatory mechanisms and budget processes uh, helped shift allocations uh, towards priority spending on basic services. And the figure that you see down here is from a study that was done uh, looking at a large number of Brazilian municipalities. Many of you will have heard of participatory budgeting as one technique and one approach for engaging citizens and civil society uh, in choosing budget priorities, not just being informed about uh, the government's priorities, but actually contributing ideas and projects and proposals that should be financed by, by the government budget. And what they saw is that over time, in the municipalities that utilized, uh, uh, that introduced participatory budgeting, health and sanitation spending, spending increased by uh, a quarter to, uh, to a third. So quite large reallocations of public resources towards basic services that better reflected the, the needs and priorities of, of the population. But it's not just about a, a, an opportunity being there for citizens to participate, it's also how that participation happens and how those decisions are taken. So there's a, uh, there's a bunch of other studies that look at uh, different types of participation. So for example, there's quite consistent evidence that if you ask citizens directly through a secret ballot, for example, to vote for different projects, the results of that will be much better in terms of reflecting people's needs uh, and, and resulting in better user satisfaction than if you sort of organize, organize village forums and village debates where people discuss about priorities. Because if you do that, then usually uh, you know, powerful interests and influential actors are more able to capture the process rather than if everybody has you know, a, a right to one vote and can vote without anybody seeing what he or she has, has chosen. So how you organize participation also has an impact on the allocation of resources and, uh, and the satisfaction of users with, uh, with the outcome of the process and with the services being provided. Third category of, uh, of, of outcomes uh, is governance outcomes. And here we, we can basically divide the evidence into two. There's a bunch of papers that sort of do uh, you know, cross-country uh, uh, regressions and correlations. They consistently find that higher transparency is associated with lower levels of corruption. Uh, in particular, when there are regular elections and uh, being held and a free press. Uh, but often these studies are not particularly illuminating in terms of establishing clear causality linkages and the direction of causality. Uh, they're typically you know, cross-sectional, cross-country uh, analyses that, that are not able to go much beyond correlations. Then we have a set of probably you know, some of the most interesting studies that we found in our review, looking at three very specific cases, one in Uganda, one in Indonesia, one in Brazil, where basically governments publishing very specific types of information actually led to very interesting outcomes in terms of either reduced corruption or uh, uh, enhanced electoral accountability. So in Uganda, what happened was um, the government, uh, the, the World Bank and the government worked together to do a, a, a piece of research called the Public Expenditure Tracking Survey. And they found out in the early 90s that of, let's say, you know, 100, Ugandan shillings that were leaving central government as grants to local schools, only about you know, 15 to 25 of those Ugandan shillings were actually getting to the schools. The other 75, 85 was getting lost along the way. Nobody really knows exactly where they went, if it was reallocation, if it was pocketing, if it was uh, anything. Uh, 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 basically, nobody has any idea. It was just leakage, uh, more generally speaking. Then the government basically said, okay, we have to stop this. Uh, our government is about poverty reduction. We need to improve service delivery. So what we'll do is we'll publish in all newspapers, 
information about what those grants should be. School by school, district by district, everybody, the information is going to be out there. Uh, and so everybody can check if the school actually got those, those funds. And within a few years, that percentage was overturned. So basically, of the 100 shillings, 85 were getting to the schools and 15 were not. And this has been hailed as based, you know, it, it is a very interesting result. The, the, uh, the, the, sort of the research is quite rigorously done. Uh, it shows that uh, um, the direct effect of the newspaper campaign, and it shows that the effect was stronger in villages that were closer to places where one could buy newspapers, basically. Uh, second case is the case of Indonesia, where basically there was, a, there was a, and again it's about corruption, but a very specific way of measuring corruption. So what they did was uh, look at the cost of village roads projects as they were sort of uh, you know, posted in the budget by, by the local government. And then the researchers did sort of a contracted an independent engineer to do uh, like an independent assessment of the cost of that same project. And they basically said if there's a big discrepancy or, or whatever difference there is between what the government puts in the budget and what the cost should be in terms of you know, a set of reasonable criteria, then we have a sign that uh, there's something funny going on, something fishy going on, some kind of corruption uh, between the contractors and the local government and so on. So they said, okay, We'll measure those differences as our dependent variable and we'll uh, say to local governments, they will basically, they randomly assign local governments to receive uh, an audit at the end of the year on those uh, projects. And they said, we're going to carry out an audit and we're going to publish the results and we're going to get the results discussed in, a, in an open forum between the local government and the population. And basically they could show that uh, in the local governments that receive the treatment, the discrepancy between the projected cost and the independent evaluation was much lower than in the, in the, uh, in the local governments that, that did not receive the, uh, the audit uh, treatment. So again, the, uh, not necessarily the fact of information being available, but the, the threat of information becoming publicly available and local government officials being shamed by the fact that uh, a, a corruption was, was to be found out, sort of brought to an improvement in, uh, and to a lowering of the cost of these road projects. Last example in Brazil, again about uh, releasing audit information in, uh, in municipalities where uh, audit reports were published that uh, documented cases of malpractice, corruption, uh, and bad management of public funds, uh, mayors that were seeking re-elections were punished by the electorate. And again, there, there's, there's a direct link between a specific type of information being published and citizens taking action in the ballot box to punish those that, that, uh, that did not have a good, uh, good performance. Final set of uh, interesting or relevant outcomes, development outcomes, and this of course is the sort of the end of that chain that we saw in the conceptual model. The evidence on these impacts is actually uh, a lot thinner and in most cases just limited to general correlations. There's again some studies of Brazilian municipalities showing that uh, uh, municipalities that introduced participatory budgeting saw a drop in, inf in, in, in infant mortality rates compared to uh, municipalities that didn't. Uh, and also that same study that, that was done in Uganda about the publication of uh, school grants also showed that uh, the, the, this information treatment not only reduced corruption and leakage, but it also helped increase the school enrollment and to some extent educational achievement measured through uh, exam scores. So there are some weaker and less widespread uh, evidence of some of these indirect channels through which transparency may or may not contribute to, uh, to development outcomes. To sort of bring all of this to, uh, to a conclusion and going back to the, the question that sort of gives a title to this presentation, does transparency work in the specific case of you know, uh, fiscal information and opportunities for citizen engagement in fiscal, uh, fiscal policies? 
In a way, you could say yes, but of course, there's a series of buts. So all of the evidence that we've reviewed points in the same direction. It is a positive direction, which sort of suggests an overall pattern in terms of uh, justifiably um, us being able to say that on average and uh, uh, in, in general terms, we can say that transparency uh, is linked to a series of, of positive outcomes. The key issue is that much of the evidence is not very rigorous in terms of making credible causality claims. Much of it is based on general correlations, cross-sectional uh, regressions, which are not able to uh, establish clearly the direction of causality. We do have a small group of rigorous studies, but those, of course, are limited to some very specific cases. So we basically seem to be somewhat stuck in this you know, internal rigor versus external validity dilemma, where the evidence that is rigorous, it cannot be readily applied to other contexts, and the, uh, the, 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 the evidence that is more general and, derf and therefore more easily applied across different contexts is not rigorous enough for us to be really able to say what caused what and, uh, and to what extent. And how do these findings more broadly relate to that, that theory of change that we saw at the beginning? There are only some of those arrows that we see at work, and it's important for us to sort of distinguish. When we look at general forms of transparency, so let's say indices or measures in terms of our independent variable that you know, broadly says, you know, on a scale from 1 to 10, the government of country X is open 79, as it would be in the case, for example, of the open budget index, which sort of you know, bundles together a series of uh, uh, observations and gives a general score to a government in terms of its general level of uh, transparency, then the only thing that we can really say is that the impacts are limited to intermediate steps and, in particular, different types of macro fiscal outcomes, as I said. Better fiscal discipline, uh, uh, less political budget cycles, less uh, creative accounting, uh, a little bit of lower borrowing costs, but nothing much beyond that. If we move to a lot more specific and locally relevant types of transparency, so either specific documents or information that uh, can have a much more specific link to citizens taking action uh, and so on, then we see uh, more interesting results. So we see uh, improvements in governance outcomes, like the one I've described, electoral accountability, lower corruption, and so on and so forth, which is quite interesting. And, uh, and also, we see citizen participation as a different type of, uh, a, of independent variable also having some interesting impacts in terms of resource allocation, governments being better able to respond to citizens' needs and priorities. Uh, uh, and, and other similar things. So, and to some extent, development outcomes as well. But as I said, the evidence on that is a lot thinner and, uh, and, less, uh, and less rigorous. So there's only a few of those arrows that we're able to map and with different degrees of, of confidence in terms of uh, uh, how strong the evidence is. Key issues and way forward, uh, I think there's basically three things that I would like to sort of leave to you as food for thought as we try and reconcile these, uh, uh, this disconnect between uh, uh, the buzzword and, uh, and the evidence. So first of all, I think we need to use and promote and devise better theoretical constructs. So better models that tell us uh, with more specificity what are exactly the causality links that we want to look at, uh, make them tighter in terms of what we're, what we're looking at and what we're looking for and, and, and build them in a way that they can be empirically tested. So just saying, you know, transparency plus participation equals accountability really doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't do it. And one example here is, is something called the transparency action cycle, which uh, Arkham Fung sort of had developed in, in some previous uh, pieces of work and then has been utilized in different, uh, in different guises. But basically, again, it's about this issue of transparency for what? Uh, and the disclosure of information that citizens can be uh, motivated to use. So users of information see the value and the salience of that information. They end up taking action on that information because they can see uh, how they might be able to make a difference. Uh, 
uh, service providers or let's say you know government counterparts or those who take decisions that uh, that are related to that to those citizen actions are sensitive and and uh, want to respond to these uh, to these actions they respond constructively and that sort of generates that link between information being disclosed and in the end uh, accountability or let's say a change in government policy or an improvement in service delivery being brought about. So we definitely need to think about new and different ways uh, to uh, theoretically construct the linkages that we want to see between transparency or fiscal openness and the desirable outcomes that we want to see as a, as a result. Second point, we need uh, more and better evidence. We definitely need more data. There's still sort of a data, despite the fact that there's more and more information out there on you know, measures of transparency, measures of participation, and so on and so forth. We, we need more data for more countries, for more, uh, for more years. We need more specific information and not just general indices. But we also need better methods. It would be nice to say, OK, you know, run experiments everywhere and we'll get rigorous evidence uh, um, uh, that we can trust in terms of uh, causality. Trouble is, you know, RCTs are very costly and they cannot be done anywhere. You, you cannot really run experiments on uh, uh, macro fiscal policy, for example. It's not easy and you can easily see how a government might actually not be very willing to do something like that. So then we need to, again, think creatively about methods, think creatively about uh, comparative case studies, for example, which can add a, a, a level of qualitative depth to, uh, to the evidence that we gather. But you know, maybe looking more specifically at case selection criteria, looking more specifically at uh, uh, process tracing techniques that can tell us more, uh, and, more in, and in a more rigorous way about what's really going on in a specific case, and also help us compare across contexts by holding some vari variables constant and so on. And again, we, in an attempt to move beyond this rigor, rigor versus validity dilemma. And then the last point, and I don't really have any, any suggestion for this, and this is much more than you know, maybe the, the field of uh, behavioral economists or sort of you know, cognitive psychologists and so on and so forth. Why is it that these cognitive fallacies are so common uh, across the policy world, across international development circles, that when something becomes a buzzword, we just seem to forget that evidence means something and that evidence is important to inform what we do and that we need to uh, look at evidence in order not to keep making the same mistakes again and again. And you know, people like you, who are probably the next, uh, the next generation of decision makers, uh, hopefully one day you will remember something about normative bias, wishful thinking, and all of these other things that I've, uh, that I've said before. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Paolo, for a great talk. Um, you've taught us a lot about transparency and also taught us how to get a job in a development organization. <laughs> Um, so for that, we're very grateful. Um, I certainly have a that few. That might change in five years' time and when the next buzzwords come in, of course. But right, maybe, so maybe you're still in time. So stay on top of your buzzwords, basically. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so I certainly have some questions, but let's throw it up into the floor um, and see if anyone has questions. We can, we can maybe take two or three at a time and then, and then collect them. So let's do one, two, three here. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I have two questions, if you allow me. Um, one is about your um, design of the study. At some point, if I understood well, you mentioned that you had studies um, in which transparency was applied at the drafting stage or approval or facilitation or auditing. Um, because the more general literature on participation indicates that the, er the earlier the stage in which citizens are involved, the better the outcomes. Um, I wanted to know whether you found this pattern in your study. Um, my second question is um, on the quality of participation. So I work on deliberative participation methods. And um, so I found that like um, a comment you made about secret ballots being more effective um, than engagement of um, participants in a discussion. Um, I found a different um, outcome in my own research, but also in research from other people that actually, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that basically when you have uh, collective thinking and dialogue, as long as you tackle power relations, um, 
you can get a more articulate and a, a more equitable um, outcome rather than aggregating um, opinions uh, from people separately. So I wanted to know where you got that mm -hmm. um, uh, finding. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Just here. Can you give me a piece of paper as well? Just so you can write this down as well. Um, my question is about the, the potential mechanisms by which transparency might result in accountability. Um, and I'm interested in your thoughts about the distinction potentially between fiscal transparency broadly conceived, um, budgets and so forth, and procurement processes more specifically. Um, because it, it, it's possible perhaps that procurement processes which, are, which operate in such a specific way might have very different and clearer mechanisms that lead to accountability. Um, ending sole source procurement might, even if you don't have public participation or, 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 or media exposure, whatever, it might by itself produce a better accountability through competition or changing the behavior of public officials, or whatever. So I'm just interested in, in if you whether you would distinguish that. Mm -hmm. So, um, shall we take take these three for now? Sure. Um, so, first question about the stage of transparency and whether that matters. Second, about secret ballots yeah. versus deliberation, and third, fiscal transparency versus procurement transparency. So, on uh, on your first question, I, I mean, I would I would agree with you that the earlier uh, citizens are able to engage in the policy process, the better. So not necessarily, you know, and, and sometimes you actually see many more examples of citizens engaging in, in the, in, at, at the early planning stages. And there's more cases of participation in planning processes rather than in budget processes. And there's more cases of participation happening in the earlier stages of the budget process, meaning through the drafting or approval stage, and less so during the, uh, the execution and audit stage. But so, I would argue that basically one does not exclude the other, first of all, and that actually uh, the later stages build on the previous ones and they uh, complete the previous ones. Why do I say that? Because we see actually from our experience and from, from the evidence out there that very often participation that happens in the, in the early stages of the planning process is not taken into account when the annual budget is, uh, is formulated. Because often for institutional, organizational, political reasons of different sorts, uh, those who are in charge of uh, you know, drawing up a five-year plan, for example, or a three-year plan, are not the same ones, uh, not the same institution, not the same office, not the same directorate than the ones who are actually busy producing the numbers that go into the, the budget proposal, for example. So there's a big disconnect between planning and budgeting. And often there's, a, there's another big disconnect between what happens until the budget is approved uh, uh, and, uh, and once the budget is being executed or implemented. So very often there's a big issue of budget credibility where basically uh, when you look at what budgets look like after they've been implemented, they look very different from uh, how they had been approved, which means that very often the participatory inputs that went into the drafting and approval of the budget were not really taken into account once implementation starts. Because again, inefficiencies, corruption, political meddling of all sorts might come into play, and then priorities get distorted as you uh, sort of uh, walk through the fiscal, the fiscal year. So what we see, or at least something that we try, the idea that we try to promote is that participation should happen pretty much at every stage. And there are very specific types of participatory mechanisms that you can have at the different stages of the budget cycle, which allow for, uh, which complement each other in terms of how citizens are able to really keep an eye on not only what gets prioritized in the budget proposal, but also how the money actually gets spent. And even uh, we see sort of increasing examples of uh, so-called participatory audits or social audits where either citizens or civil society organizations sort of carry out parallel audits or they take part in government audits as independent experts of, of some sorts. And that it basically uh, is an attempt to address some of the weaknesses and some of the limitations of uh, those earlier stages uh, mechanisms that, that we've mentioned. You know, participatory budgeting is an example, but there's a range of other ones. On your second question, <clears throat> 
again, I think this is an area where, you know, in no way the evidence that is currently available is conclusive. We're talking about a, probably on this issue of, let's say, secret ballot versus open meeting. Uh, there's only two or three, I think there's three papers that we include in our, in our review. So very much open for new, uh, uh, new and better evidence to be generated and to contribute to the debate. What they found was that, uh, that basically open town hall meetings or whatever, open village forums, ended up not being structured in the deliberative way that you were describing. So that basically meant that they were not designed to take into account the possibilities of capture by powerful elites or by certain you know, sets of actors. They did not give voice to underrepresented groups like women or the youth or others. And they were not structured in a way that allowed for, let's say, informed debate around priorities, which then meant that the secret ballot was often seen as a better way for people to just basically state their opinion without any of those uh, external influences and often being able to better uh, uh, address uh, underrepresentation of, of certain groups. What I would agree with you is that if the open meetings were structured in such a way that you know, they were uh, deliberative, they were based on adequate information, uh, they sort of forced the government to present and justify their position, uh, assess alternatives, they gave voice to underrepresented groups. If all of those conditions were satisfied, then I think you wouldn't see that same, that same discrepancy. That participation is another big buzzword. And a lot of it has to do with, I mean, I think there is some research nowadays proving that even like minor investment in the quality of the participation yeah. can make a huge difference. Yeah. But if you don't make that investment, you may have counter, like unexpected outcomes. I, I fully agree with you. And as I said, I think, again, we, we didn't look at participation broadly conceived. We just looked at participation in budget processes. So it's, it's, a, it's a small cut of that, of that overall field. Uh, but it's definitely one where we didn't see enough evidence to basically you know, allow us to, uh, to make any great, great statements. So definitely, there's a lot of space there for further research. Uh, finally, on your question about procurement, we were actually quite surprised that in our broad review, so I consider procurement to be part of, let's say, public financial management. It's, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the figures are, but you could reasonably expect that, you know, uh, probably 20 to 40 percent of government spending anywhere, anytime goes into procuring goods and services or infrastructure projects of different, uh, of different types, which means it's a huge slice of public spending and one that often does not get as much attention as it should. I think the tide is turning. As I said, there's, uh, there's this new open contract in partnership initiative that, that focuses on transparency and procurement. There's, uh, there's a definitely increasing interest uh, both on the research side and on the policy side on uh, how procurement works and, uh, and the ways in which transparency may uh, um, you know, improve better outcomes by uh, allowing for more competition and uh, uh, you know, without necessarily having to have big participatory mechanisms and so on and so forth. So I, again, we were expecting to find more evidence out there on, on some of these things. We didn't. And I, I think that's another area where there's, that's definitely ripe for more, more research and, and, and certainly interesting, interesting findings as well. All right, the next round of questions, we had one, two, three. Thank you. Uh, what you're talking uh, is very interesting and uh, sort of provoking. And uh, uh, it seems that even though you <laughs> focused on the uh, transparency in the international budget, uh, now I want to ask you another two minute questions. The first, um, it seems that uh, the, the term transparency is always related with another word, openness. So I wonder uh, whether or not there is a difference between two words, uh, transparency and openness, the first question. The second question is that um, 
what's the limitation to the implementation of a transparency? Yeah. So um, I just give you an example. So uh, in China, for, as you have mentioned, the sunlight is said to be the best uh, disinfectant, and uh, and the higher transparency is uh, always associated with the lower uh, levels of corruption. For way, for good, bad, for better anti-corruption, in China, uh, somebody argues that the income and the prosperity of those public employees, especially the public uh, civil servants, should be open and uh, transparent. But somebody said that is against the right of privacy. So do you think there is a conflict between two? Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Nalianga Masiko. So I'm doing a course at the Blavaknik. And uh, my question was around, OK, it's a, it's a very random question. Um, the OECD and the IMF are made up of organizations or countries that claim transparency but somewhat pra practice only a part of it. So, I mean, I do acknowledge that, there's, that a lot of countries have come from far in terms of transparency, but then my issue was around the Ministry of Defense, which is still a very big issue right now. I mean, a lot of people query that the Ministry of Defense is the one that takes up a, a large part of the budget and then nobody actually audits them. So what I wanted to find out what these organizations are trying to do to find a loophole or to sort of minimize their spending or um, sort of watch them because it's a big budget. Mm -hmm. That's my first question. I'll reserve the second one. Thank you. Right. Should we take one more? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so we've spoken a lot about the benefits of transparency. I was wondering if generally you could speak about what the limits of transparency are. So in your experience, can there be too much transparency? Um, have there been times when full transparency has backfired and when openness leads to negative outcomes or unintended outcomes? Do you get all those, Paolo? Yes. Okay. Great. Great questions. So let me um, start with your first question about the differences between transparency and openness and in the way in which we define them. As you say, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Sometimes that can create some confusion. For the purposes of, of the review of the evidence that we did, and at least more generally in our approach, we define openness to include both transparency and participation. So uh, government openness uh, is, is um, sort of results in two things. It results in governments proactively making information available, but also proactively making opportunities available for citizens and civil society groups to uh, have a voice in, uh, uh, in fiscal policy making and in budget policy making. So at least, again, in, our, in the way in which we have defined them and in the way in which we have used them for, the, for, this, uh, for this study, Openness incorporates transparency, but it also incorporates uh, participation and opportunities for citizen engagements. Those are the two aspects of government openness that we, ha uh, we are interested in and that we have utilized. Um, your second point, I think, relates basically to the, to the last question about the, the, the limits and the limitations of transparency. Uh, it's quite interesting when when we go and talk to, or let, let, let's say, in, uh, in all of the times that I've gone out to speak to governments about transparency, they often come back with this, uh, with this issue. And they say, well, you know, we don't really want to be very transparent. And usually the kinds of uh, justification that they give are two. The first one is we don't want that information to be used against us. Ah, if we publish information, then the opposition party is going to use it uh, you know, and, and say things that are not true, and they're going to accuse us of all kinds of things, and so we can't let that happen. And then there's these you know, civil society groups out there, and they take the information, and they don't know how to use it, and then they start putting things in the newspaper, and that sort of reflects badly on us, and sometimes it's not even true, and they don't really know what the numbers mean, and so on and so forth. That's often one, 
uh, one response. The other response is, actually, you know, we're not, we're not really sure of the quality of these numbers, so we don't really want to put them out there, and we need to improve our systems, and uh, we, we will only publish this information once we're really sure that, that, it, you know, that we really, really know about the quality of the underlying information, so we shouldn't really uh, be transparent until, uh, transparent until we're able to really um, uh, put our systems in order. And usually my response to them is, you know, actually, first of all, people using information, uh, not only it is their rights, and at the end of the day, it's the taxes that they pay that pay your salary, and that uh, 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 and these are public resources, so citizens have a right to know what, what the money is being spent on and how it is utilized, and it's really your challenge to make sure that if they use it, if they use the information in ways that you think are incorrect, then you should engage with them to explain to them what the numbers mean. And it's not often transparency doesn't necessarily mean simply putting information out there in whatever format with no explanation, with no you know, user-friendly interface that allows different actors to make sense of the numbers and use them in an informed and, uh, 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 and you know, in a way that makes sense. It's actually your responsibility not to just put it out there, but also to explain to people what the numbers mean so that they can use it in ways that are correct. And at the end of the day, the fact that people can use it in ways that you don't like is not, uh, is not an argument against transparency. It's an argument for democracy. So you, should, you shouldn't really say, I'm against transparency. You should say, I'm against democracy. And if you're willing to go that way, then, then it's going to be another debate. Uh, and the issue about the quality of the systems also, I don't think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's actually a really valid one, because at the end of the day, most governments will have a, a, a much stronger incentive to put their system, their, the correct system in place once the information is out there so that, they, uh, that they're able to defend what is being put out there. And otherwise, what we see happening time and time again is governments delaying the publication of information even though uh, the quality of the systems might have improved because they're waiting for some moment when, when their system is perfect before they publish the information, which probably will never, will never come. And it's often once the information is in the public domain that they get some feedback and some criticism, and then they have a stronger incentive to, put, uh, to improve the systems that they have in place for, uh, for generating that information. But this is only sort of a, a general response. There have been some uh, arguments being made sort of let's say, against uh, transparency and the fact that too much transparency might be, uh, might be bad. There's actually some very you know, prominent uh, academics like Amitai Exioni and Francis Fukuyama who have published pieces saying uh, too much transparency could be bad because you're not really you know, letting government do its work. Uh, if, if, you know, constantly uh, politicians and, and civil servants are under the scrutiny of a million eyes and you know, their every action is being uh, broadcasted uh, out in the open, they might not be able to uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of use informal channels and systems that get the machine working a lot better. So there's research out there which is not fiscal in its, uh, in its sort of more stringent sense, but that shows that uh, the, the, the transparency about uh, the US Congress, for example, actually made lobbies a lot more powerful, that once you know, all of the discussions and all of the other things between congressmen and between congressmen and other people were uh, opened up to, to public scrutiny, then uh, lobbies became a lot more effective in terms of capturing uh, the legislative uh, process in the US. So I do think that certainly uh, there can be some arguments that you know, after a certain level, let's say, transparency, too much transparency might have some unintended consequences. I, I didn't say it might be bad. I said it might have some unintended consequences that we need to take into account. I certainly think that on average across the world and probably for the foreseeable future, we're nowhere close that sort of uh, flexing point. And that the majority of countries nowadays do not provide you know, barely enough information to their citizens and, and, and civil society. 
in formats that are user friendly, that allow the population uh, uh, and, and other actors, sort of collective actors, to really understand what's going on, to really uh, be able to form an opinion about public policies and so on and so forth. So we're very far away. F getting to your point about, about privacy, yes, I think there are some issues where, you know, wh where privacy issues come come in and, and we should take them into account. In some countries, there is this debate going on about whether the salaries of public servants should be, uh, should be posted online or not. My view is that, sure, why not? I mean, you know, in, in Brazil where I live, the fiscal transparency portal, you can go in and look at how much the president earns and, you, and look at how much you know, the, the nurse that, that works at, uh, at the health post next to your house earns. And it's all in there, and, and why shouldn't it be? That's public money. That's taxpayers' money. Uh, does it, if you, know, if, if you want to, if you are a public servant, you should put yourself up for that kind of scrutiny because it's, it's the people who are paying your salary. To me, uh, you know, there's, there's no real argument for privacy uh, in that specific example. There might be others. Uh, I mean, I can't think of any just now, but you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, there might be a few arguments for privacy that make sense, only in those cases where not respecting the privacy might actually lead to negative consequences in terms of commercial dealings and so on. Or, for example, not uh, you know, publishing information about new tax policies before these are finalized to avoid sort of businesses preempting these, uh, these changes before they're put in place. But you know, I think these are very, very limited. And finally, to your point about defense budgets, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, these are huge black holes in a large number of countries. And it's very, very difficult to get details about. You can usually get some information about how much the government is giving in general to the Department of Defense or the Ministry of Defense or whatever. It's very difficult to then go beyond that and look at the detail of how much goes to the different branches or to the different directorates. Procurement is co shrouded in you know, complete secrecy and so on and so forth. Of course, there are some security arguments behind it that, again, to some extent might make sense. But again, I think on average nowadays, there's, you know, it's, it's, uh, the levels of transparency that exist around defense budgets uh, are much lower than any reasonable level of transparency that we should expect. There has been some interesting research done by Transparency International on this uh, that, you, that you might want to look up. They've, they've published a few sort of reports around uh, the transparency of defense spending in, uh, in a number of countries. We don't really cover that specifically in our, in our index, for example. So we treat, I mean, we used to have some questions on secret items that would, you know, they, they would include some military uh, items, they would include some secret service items, some other security related spending. But we found out that it was so difficult to actually uh, verify uh, that those numbers were correct that in the end we, we, we gave it up and, and we recognized the fact that you need a much more specific lens and a much more specific approach to be able to uh, address these issues in a, in, in a reasonable way. I totally agree with you. I think it's a, again, as I said, it's a big black hole that deserves a lot more, a lot more sunlight, as we were saying at the at the beginning of the of the talk. But unfortunately, as you as you know, there's so many interests, so many, um, you know, again, sort of layers of, of of secrecy involved that, in order to be able to really see what's going on, a lot needs to change before before sunlight can. Uh, and shine in. Great. Um, thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you for coming out and joining us on the live stream. Um, so yeah, please join me in thanking Paolo for a great talk. Thanks. <laughs> My email is up there if, uh, if people are interested. Uh, that's our website as well.
We will, uh, as I said, launch the new results uh, of the Open Budget Survey in uh, late January next year. I might be coming through in February again if people are interested in having maybe more of an informal exchange around you know, country-specific results and what they might mean and where it comes from and what it might imply. We can certainly uh, try and uh, set something up. Thanks for coming. Thank you.